Hello, I'm Frank Holland, anchor of Worldwide Exchange. I'm here at UPS headquarters and I'm joined by UPS CEO Carol Tomei on the company's Q1 earnings day. Carol, thank you so much for joining us. Well, Frank, welcome to the UPS headquarters. All right, thank you. It's great to be here today in Atlanta. So let's talk about the quarter and get right into the numbers. Um, UPS reported revenue of $22.93 billion. That was just slightly below estimates. Profit of $2.20 a share, just one cent below estimates. How would you describe the quarter and how the macro environment is impacting your business, especially e-commerce? Well, the year is turning out to be a very interesting year. At the beginning of the year, we provided guidance for a base case and a downside case, case given the cloudiness of the macro environment. And I was super proud of the performance in the first quarter. We came in within $244 million of our base case revenue and right on our operating profit and margin base case. But the cadence by the month was really different than we had thought. Uh, volume in our U.S. business was higher than our plan in, in January, about on our plan in February, and then considerably lower than our plan in March. And as we moved into April, we saw that same trend continue. So we're like, wow, things have really changed from what we thought it would be. So today we came out, while we were delighted with the results, we came out and said for the balance of the year, we think we'll be on the downside or the low end of the guidance that we had provided at the beginning of the year. I want to dig into those month-by-month -month numbers. You sure. spelled it out on the call a bit. We're talking the U.S. numbers. So we in are. January, you were down 3%. In February, down 5%. And then in March, down 7%. You said that continued into April. Um, what led to those declines? What are your customers telling you about demand? Well, it's really interesting. We saw retail sales in the United States take a market decline in the month of March. And we saw that in our business as well. There's a real change in consumer shopping behavior, moving from goods to service, spending more of their wallet on things like food. 9% of household budgets is going to food now compared to 7% just a couple of years ago. Um, we see consumers spending money on discretionary items. Items and uh, excuse me on essential items moving away from discretionary items so there's a market change and I've got some anecdotal stories I can tell you about what our customers are seeing with their customer base first as people are going back into the office they're tending to go into the store rather than ordering online there's a real shift in that regard um, they're they're spending more time really on the essential goods and not so much on those big projects that they were investing in during the COVID time so it's just just a cycle it's just a cycle and we'll get through this cycle what we are doing at UPS is controlling what we can control and I couldn't be happier with the productivity that we delivered in the first quarter okay you're also facing another cycle your negotiations with the Teamsters the biggest union at UPS now according to your data and Teamster data the Teamsters they make up roughly about two-thirds of your workforce um, their contract expires in July um, you have said very optimistically that there's it's possible for a win 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 a triple sided win but at the same time on today's call you said these negotiations they are weighing on your business it's stopping you from making some sales it's also stopping you from being able to win some new customers so can you explain how is a win 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 possible with that setup well, I think it's important to note that we've been with the Teamsters for over a hundred years. We invited the Teamsters to join UPS. This is not our first rodeo. We've negotiated contracts over a hundred years. And I'm, I'm delighted where we are with the Teamsters today because if you think about our North Star, where we both want to go, that is a growing and thriving UPS. It's good for Teamsters, it's good for UPS, and it's good for our people. So we are aligned on our North Star. Now there are issues that they have raised that they'd like to work through and we'd like to work through those issues too. We're not far apart on the issues. We just need to get to the bargaining table and work it out. So I'm highly confident that we will deliver a handshake by the time our contract expires the end of July. But here's the reality of all that. If you are a shipper, let's say you're in charge of supply chain for a large company, and you need to go in front of your boss or your board to say, I guarantee you there won't be a work stoppage. They may say, how do you know there won't be a work stoppage? There's no guarantee in life except for death and taxes. 
So it would be naive of us to think there wouldn't be some volume di uh, diversion, and there has been, but not much. We saw a decline, as you mentioned, in our average daily volume in the first quarter. It wasn't because of the Teamster negotiation. It was because of the macro. Now, I will say, selling into this market is interesting with that contract weighing, but you know, we'll have that contract done by the end of July, and when we do, we're going to hit it hard from a sales perspective. So I have to ask, there are a lot of analysts that are concerned that this renegotiation, it may increase the cost of labor for UPS. Um, as part of these negotiations, are you mentioning some of these volume declines? Is that a factor in these negotiations? So we are looking at the future of where we're taking our company and not the current moment, because this is just a cycle. We're looking at the future, and for us, it's about doing right by our people, doing right by our customers, doing right by our share owners. I think there's something to keep in mind, Frank, about our Teamsters. Do you know that our drivers make $93,000 a year? They have benefits worth $50,000, and they pay nothing for health care. These are high-paying, great jobs. That's important to keep in mind, and I'm proud of that. That negotiation continues, as you mentioned, the contract ends in July. I also want to go to your guidance. You now are forecasting the low end of your prior guidance right now, but you believe there's going to be a reacceleration in the second half of the year. On the call, you said you believe 56% of profit will come in the final two quarters. What's giving you confidence in that reacceleration? So there are a few things. Uh, first, in the United States, we will have a handshake deal by the end of July, which allows us then to sell in ways that we can't sell today. And we have a big pipeline of business, over $6 billion in our pipeline. So I'm convinced with the value that we offer our customers, we can sell. Do you know our service, our services, our um, uh, service performance is better than any competitor on the marketplace? Value is defined by what the customer is willing to pay, and they are willing to pay for service. And then, of course, we have peak. That's the holiday season in the fourth quarter, so we should expect our volume to grow in the fourth quarter. So in the United States, that's why we're confident that we'll have more volume in the back half of the year than in the front half of the year. Outside of the United States, we've had some real challenges, as has the world, in China. And we saw export business out of China drop dramatically. While it's still not better than it was a year ago, every week it's getting sequentially better. So that gives us confidence that things will get better as we move into the back half of the year. You were mentioning long term. You and the Teamsters, you say, are both thinking long term. So speaking of long term, your strategy here at UPS, it's shifted from better not bigger to better and bolder. Um, for investors out there watching, can you give us a sentence or two? What is better and bolder? Well, we always want to get better. We view productivity as a virtuous cycle here, and so we always want to get better. We always want to improve the customer experience, and we think about the customer experience now end-to-end, -end, from shipper to recipient. We have 18, uh, 16 customer journeys that we're investing in to improve that end-to-end -end experience. We always want to get better but we also want to make some bolder moves. And I'm very excited about bolder moves. And let me give you a few examples. Uh, one bolder move is lean into healthcare logistics. Healthcare logistics is highly complicated. It's cold chain logistics. And we're leaning in a big way because we want to be the number one provider of healthcare logistics. We're going to do that through organic growth as well as inorganic growth. Um, this year, we're opening up seven new buildings in our healthcare logistics space. We'll be a $10 billion business this year. Last year in the fourth quarter, we acquired a company called Bomi, who provides cold chain logistics in Italy and other European countries. So we, you know, it's some and some, some organic, some inorganic, and we can grow this business in a big way. That's a bolder move. Another bolder move is leaning into digital access program. This is an amazing initiative that we have working with large large platforms like Shopify and eBay and just think about all the platforms that are out there. We have 25 partners actually in our digital access uh, program. When I started, Frank, the revenues in that program were around $100 million. This year they will be $3 billion. And we're growing not just in the United States but outside of the United States too. We now have our digital access program in over 16 countries. And then another bolder move is logistics as a service. You know, shippers want to have visibility end to end. Where is my product end to end, right? Especially during COVID, we learned that that visibility was essential. So we're leaning into providing visibility um, end to end. We're leaning into providing 
digital experiences for our customers that we've never provided before. This year, logistics as a service for us will be a $1 billion business. I have to ask, there's a big wave when it comes to artificial intelligence. What does AI mean for UPS? It means a lot of things. So we've been using AI and machine learning for a number of years. In fact, if you think about Orion, which is our routing technology, that's powered by AI and ML. When you think about a tool that we call Deal Manager, which allows us to price a bid for small and medium-sized businesses that used to be informed by tribal knowledge, by experience, human experience, is now powered by machinery. And the cool thing is, is that our win rate is higher and our discounting is lower because of the power of the machine. We now have Deal Manager uh, used across the United States for all of our salespeople. Um, so we've been using it for a long time. Now we're leaning into generative AI, and this is so exciting and so scary, but more exciting than scary. Uh, we've got three use cases that we're just kicking off with generative AI, all within the UPS family. You know, we have 540,000 UPSers around the world. If they have a question about a policy, let's say it's, oh, what is my um, vacation policy or what is my family leave policy? It's very hard to get that information. And then if you get the information and you have a question, well, you've got to go find someone to ask the question. With generative AI, you can just ask the question and it'll respond back to you. I just think the experience for our people will be so improved. So we're using it for our people and we're going to also use it for our customers in these use cases. All right, it's a brave new world there. It's a brave new world. So in June, you're celebrating three years yeah. as the CEO of UPS. Yeah. Um, you certainly started during, you said interesting before, an interesting time during the COVID-19 pandemic. Over these three years, how would you describe your experience and what's changed and how has UPS changed? Well, it's been a remarkable experience and I'm just so honored and privileged to lead this amazing company, particularly over the past three years. Um, we knew it, but it became quite true that UPSers are essential. Our say-do ratio is high and I'm so proud of our UPSers who truly live our purpose. And that's one thing we did, Frank, when I joined is we knew what we did. We moved 2% of the world's GDP, 6% of the US GDP, but we hadn't declared our why. So we put together a team of people and we asked them to declare our why. And they did a masterful job of interviewing UPSers and retirees and, and communities. And they came back with our why, which is moving our world forward by delivering what matters. And I love that because you can unpack it in so many ways. It's not just about delivering goods, but doing good too. And I think we, we've done a lot of that. You think we were the first integrator to deliver COVID-19 vaccines. Now we've delivered way over a billion vaccines in over a hundred countries, not just from a commercial uh, per perspective, but also through a philanthropic perspective. In fact, one of my favorite stories is how we delivered vaccines in Rwanda using drones. So, you know, it's just been an, an amazing experience to be part of this team during this very interesting time. But I also learned a few things when I joined is what got us here wasn't going to get us to where we needed to go. Our customers were changing, our competitors were changing, and the rate of change was accelerating. So we needed to lean in that change and we, and we needed to change a bit. We were an old company. When I joined, we were 112 years old. This is now our 116th year. Like many older companies, layers of bureaucracy had come in. That's just, that just happens. And so we're like, you know, we, we, gotta, we gotta get rid of some of that. We were running the company by committee. So we got rid of the committees and we tried to push the decision making down closer to the customer to enhance speed. Because speed is how you win in this game. So that was a, a, a really an important change. We did some things that were, didn't cost a dime, but were I think very impactful from just a, 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 a culture perspective. For example, our tattoo policy was more restrictive than the U.S. Army. If you were African American, you could not have natural hair, so you could never braid a twist or fro. If you were male, you could not have facial hair. And I'm like, I don't think our customers are going to care about that. We need to be professional, of course, 
but let's let's bring our real, authentic, genuine self to work. I think that's a better place to be. So we made those changes, and that that was pretty well received, I think, by most people. Maybe some former retirees or retirees weren't very happy with that, but most people were happy with that. Certainly, our customers were happy with that. We really leaned into brand relevance and upped our game from a brand relevance perspective. And you know, I could go on and on about the changes that we've made while staying core to who we are. And who we are is we're a values-based business. Started now 116 years ago by Jim Casey and a buddy. Do you know this story? Jim Casey was a teenager. He and a buddy borrowed $100 and created this company by delivering packages on bicycles. And now 116 years from there, you know, we're delivering packages in 220 countries and territories around the globe. And what I love about the story is that it was started by entrepreneurs. And I'd like that entrepreneurial spirit to be as live today as it was back when Jim Casey and his buddies started the company. Well, Carol Tomei, you are celebrating three years in June. Happy anniversary in Thank advance. You. It's been an interesting three years. Your words, it certainly it has is. been an interesting three years. Thank you so much for your time on this earnings day. My pleasure. I'm Frank Holland, anchor of Worldwide Exchange. Thank you for watching.